Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Kaylee Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Well, corruption has always been a problem in Hawaii politics through the years. Across the state, elected lawmakers at both the state and county levels have been embroiled in bribery and ethics scandals recently. And beyond that, there have been many cases of corruption involving the law enforcement officials, business leaders, and many state and county bureaucrats. Rooting out corruption seems like a daunting task, but thankfully there are people in Hawaii who care about that and are doing just that. And that's what we're going to discuss on today's show. Aloha, I'm joined today by a man I respect greatly. He's retired Judge Dan Foley, who last year was chosen to chair the Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct following some serious corruption scandals at the state legislature. The commission was created to recommend changes that might make Hawaii's government more transparent and accountable and help eliminate the state's culture of corruption that so many of us here in Hawaii abhor. Before retiring in 2016, and I use the term retiring guardedly, Dan served for 16 years on the Hawaii Intermediate Court of Appeals. Prior to that, he worked in private practice and is well known for his civil rights litigation, including representing the individuals whose case played a major role in the push to legalize same-sex marriage. Dan is also a non-resident judge on the Pulau Supreme Court, a role he was appointed to in 2011. Would you join me in welcoming to the program, Dan Foley. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I've just really appreciated your role in the public in terms of not only the, the official positions you've held, but in terms of your own advocacy of government that is cleaner and more transparent. Can you tell me just a little bit how you got involved in your passionate advocacy for this? Well, it happened shortly after uh a number of legislators were indicted, uh, a member of the House and a member of the Senate. And we had uh, ongoing corruption cases at the county level as well. I got a call from House Speaker Scott Psyche, who I've known for a long time. He was a student of mine when I taught civil rights at the law school. Um, and he asked me uh, if I would share this commission he was going to create. He told me uh, what it would be, uh, who would be on it. And um, I said, yes. I mean, um, how can you say no when you have a problem in government and there seems to be a serious effort to uh, address it? Um, I said I would do it. And um, the uh, commission was created um, in the 2022 session. I became chair. When the commission to improve standards of conduct was put together, what was its purpose? What were the outcomes that were expected? The the resolution, House resolution that created the commission went through the, the incidences of corruption and scandal, the loss of public trust, and it directed my commission to primarily focus on the laws that govern ethics, campaign spending, lobbying, and to make recommendations to, to make improvements, uh, to address corruption, and to restore public trust. Well, there were quite a few people who were somewhat jaded with the response of the, the government in the creation of another commission, and not that enthusiastic that it would ultimately result in anything. Uh, when you were asked to be part of it, what were your feelings about the prospects of success? You know, I understand that sentiment, and, and we both heard it. Um, you know, government creates a commission or a board to, to make a report to put on the shelf as a way uh, distraction to avoid the problem. Um, and I would not have accepted the appointment to the commission unless I thought the House was serious. And the composition of the commission impressed me. It was the executive directors of the Ethics Commission, Campaign Spending Commission, representatives from Common Cause Hawaii, League of Women Voters, very respected former legislator, uh, Barbara Maramoto, who I got to work with and just absolutely love, um, and Flo Nakakuni, the former U.S. attorney. So I figured with a group like this, 
with a track record for open, transparent, honest government, independent, uh, working with them, I thought we could actually come up with something meaningful. And I got the commitment from Speaker Psyche that the House would address it. Well, now that you look back, the commission's work is is finished, I, I take it. What? How do you evaluate it? What uh, What came out of that? Well, we, we submitted process. a report that ran 396 pages, and that did not include all the documents that you can find on the House uh, webpage that uh, we utilized. Um, we recommended the passage of 28 bills to increase transparency, accountability in government. Of those 28 bills, 20 passed in some form. Some became part of the House and, and Senate rules, administrative manuals. But you've been around. Uh, to have a commission submit a report, recommend 28 bills, and the first session to have 20 pass, that's remarkable success. Now, there are at least eight measures, significant measures that didn't pass, but this is the first regular session, um, and there's another one coming up. Now, I've read columns and seen comments, uh, big failure, nothing accomplished, can't trust the legislature. Um, and I just addressed the League of Women Voters a couple of weeks ago, and I compared it to a, an NBA game. We're at halftime. You know, we, we, we finished half the work. We had a good first half. 20 of 28 ain't bad. And uh, now there's a lot more to do, significant bills to do. We have another regular session coming up. Let's continue to engage the legislature, work hard, and 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 finish the job. That's That's my view. So... I, I'm encouraged. Um, I do think we uh, have made progress. The governor, I believe, will sign the bills. The governor has also said he will take executive action to address areas where bills have not yet passed, maybe like access to public records. So I was very pleased with the uh, the results. Uh, Representative uh, Tarnas, who chairs the House Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee, conducted public hearings on every single one of our bills and passed out all but two. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. Well, I'm glad to hear of the positive results so far. But as you, as you say, it's part of an ongoing process, but a, a good start at the very least. Now, uh, uh, the commission's formation was on the heels of a, a period of time when we were watching reports about corruption on almost every news broadcast in the evenings uh, for a period of time. We learned about our uh, former legislators, our former Honolulu police chief, his wife, and, and other notable individuals. It seemed as though Hawaii was going through uh, quite a period of crime and corruption in public government. Oh, was that the case, was it, or was this just a, a passing uh, uh, episode? Um, I think it is the case, and the U.S. attorney's investigation is not over. Uh, I expect more indictments to come down, um, possibly another legislator or two, more in county government. So we're not finished with the investigation and prosecution. Um, one of the things um, we recommended that the legislature passed, we recommended three bills to address corruption, uh, fraud, false claims, and false statements modeled after their federal counterparts. A lot of people ask, well, why is it the federal government doing this? Why not the state attorney general? Why not county prosecutors? Well, for one thing, the federal government has better statutes to, to utilize. And we, working with the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, um, the state attorney general, all four county prosecutors, we crafted three bills modeled after the federal bills, all three passed. So I do expect uh, uh, not only the U.S. Attorney's Office to continue their investigation prosecution, I would expect more activity from the Attorney General's Office and the four county prosecutors. Uh, part of the uh, collection or package of recommendations from my commission um, is to make government more transparent, uh, to make it more difficult to have some of the conduct. Uh, some of the conduct um, that we've read about, especially with the legislature, came from lobbyists. So we've had a number of bills passed and some signed into law already by the governor that makes it very transparent relationships between legislators and lobbyists, 
what lobbyists are working on, prohibiting lobbyists from making campaign gifts. Um, and, you know, not one measure is the magic bullet. Um, corruption's never going to disappear, but we're going to make it more difficult and we're going to make it riskier and we're going to make the penalties more severe. We're out here in the middle of the ocean in Hawaii, the, the most isolated archipelago on Earth, uh, and certainly uh, distinct from the contiguous other states in the United States. How does the corruption you've seen here in the state of Hawaii stack up against corruption in other states, or even in Palau, for that matter? Well, Palau is great. Um, they are really serious. They have a special prosecutor committed just to rooting out and prosecuting corruption. And that, the number of the cases I've sat on is, is uh, convictions and, and reviewing those convictions. So Palau is doing a great job. It's taking it very serious. I think we're doing better than the mainland. I had a former law partner who got a master's degree from Tulane and, and watched a race for mayor in Louisiana. and one candidate for sheriff said, of course, I'm not honest, but at least I admit it, you know, so uh, we have New Jersey. That. Yeah, we have New York, etc. So I don't know how uh, it compares to the mainland. I don't think that's really important. I think whatever we're happening in here is, is we can't tolerate. And let's become the cleanest, most transparent, most accountable government um, in the United States and in the Pacific. Why not? Well, is it getting better or is it getting worse? Uh, as you look well, at Hawaii's well, history since statehood, let, let me give you that marker. You know, it's, let's take the Bishop of State, for example. Yes, uh, the Bishop of State broken trust. Yes, exactly. Bishop of State operated as it did forever. What changed, though, was the culture. Not so much the way Bishop of State operated, but all of a sudden people said, enough is enough. That type of behavior is not acceptable anymore. Um, the Supreme Court, as you know, was caught up in that in, as accounted in Randy Ross broken trust. And Randy, um, who, who I love, and I'm sure you do, uh, testified before our commission. And he said, it's really a matter of culture. We have to change the culture. It's the, the, the old way of doing business, uh, closing your eyes to wrongdoing, uh, not sticking your neck out. Uh, when there was corruption in the judiciary in the, the 80s, uh, whistleblower on Cappy Caminos and, and uh, fat boy Okuda um, uh, of a lot of, you know, payoff and, and between the judiciary and the legislature and members of the executive branch. I brought the whistleblower lawsuit on behalf of the deputy that reported it. He couldn't find another lawyer, including a Republican lawyer, uh, to take the case. And a number of cases I've taken when I was a lawyer is because other lawyers wanted to avoid controversy. When I took the Save Sandy Beach case, that's when Bishop of State was strong. No other lawyer would represent that coalition. So I took it. So I think it's a matter of, of changing the culture. And um, I think this commission's a beginning. I think holding people accountable for, for corruption is the beginning. Um, so, so I think that's good. Dan, that's an interesting thing, the culture. But who creates this culture? Is it created by politicians, by political parties? Is it created by the general public, by businesses and so forth? How do we actually end up shaping the culture? I know that the commission is, is recommending uh, laws and legal measures and so forth. But what really brings about the culture that we live in that tolerates and even fosters. Well, you know, in answer to your question, it's, it's really all of the above. Uh, all of that, all of those contribute to, to what we have. But ultimately, it's the voter. You know, people complain about the legislature. They'll say the presiding officer is a dictator, or the chair of the Ways and Means or Finance Committee is a dictator. Um, Everybody in the legislature has one vote. If people are unsatisfied with the presiding officers because the majority of that body allows it, or same with the chair, or same with measures, um, and the voters put them in and keep them in every two years. Um, 
businesses uh, will do what they can to prosper. Um, government officials will get away with what they can get away with. Many of the proposals uh, that we made and that are being passed will make those things more difficult, to make it more transparent so the voter can cast a more educated ballot, uh, to make um, dealings between businesses, lobbyists, and legislators more transparent, which hopefully will make that more honest, to make government officials and employees more accountable uh, for their actions and to make their actions more transparent. So if they go wrong, they will be held accountable. So it's our desire from the commission, our proposals, and I think we have made some progress to address all of that. But ultimately, it comes down to the voter. You know, um, if the and one of the things that bothers me, you've said and you alluded to it. Uh, a lot of people will say, "Oh, this commission report won't mean anything." Uh, whatever the legislature will do will mean nothing. Well, that plays into the cynicism of the voter, the disillusionment. We have the lowest, you know, one of the lowest voting turnouts in the country. Um, so my whole message is let's get engaged. As bad as it is, is. I take, you, you mentioned the same-sex marriage case. I took that in 1991. Not one state, not one country in the world had same-sex marriage. 70% of the public was against it. And that's probably a modest evaluation. What were the odds? But, you know, you roll up your sleeves, you get to work, you be positive, you don't give up, and you can accomplish a lot of things. 50 states, 30 countries now have it. Uh, so why can't we do the same in cleaning up our government? Just because it's been, let's say, <laughs> a little less than honest and transparent in the past doesn't mean it can't be honest and transparent in the future. Well, Dan, the commission came up with dozens of recommendations. And as you mentioned earlier, many of them have made their way into legislation and uh, will soon perhaps be signed by the governor into law. Well, what's one or two uh, really good bills uh, that uh, you feel were passed that will make a difference? Well, the, the one I mentioned, the, the sort of trio of fraud, false claims, false statements, giving our state and county law enforcement the tools to join the U.S. Attorney's Office investigating and prosecuting corruption. I think the trio of bills that deal with lobbyists, to make lobbyists disclose all measures they're working on um, by bill number, by measure number, uh, to prohibit them from making gifts to legislators, for legislators in their financial disclosure to disclose all relationship with lobbyists. They're simple things that could have an impact. The League of Women Voters pushed through a voter's guide. It's a digital voter's guide. Uh, so we have a more informed electorate. Um, um, one of the things you know that the public doesn't fully take advantage of that they could, and I'm sure you do, the legislature has a very transparent website. Uh, I started going to the legislature in the 80s where everything was hard copy. It took you all day, every day to track something. Now it's at your fingertip. Uh, but some of the recommendations we made that haven't gone through yet, um, some of the committees are doing it, other committees are not, have public testimony available far in advance of a hearing. Um, the sort of fiasco we saw with the budget, to have that not repeat again, to have measures out there before they come up for a vote so the public can inspect and respond. Um, some of the bills um, that are pending um, in the legislature that I think are important that haven't passed yet is public financing of elections, uh, term limits where there's a difference of opinion, uh, uh, no campaign contributions from contractors, grantees of public funds, their officers and family members to candidates. Um, uh, use of campaign funds. One thing we recommended right now, you can take campaign funds and you can spend them just about on anything. You can give it to organizations, you can give it to scholarships, you can give it to other candidates. We said campaign funds should just be used for the campaigns of that candidate. Um, and, and that's pending, although it's in a sort of uh, unrecognizable form. Um, but I, uh, I did write an article, uh, it was in the, uh, Honolulu, um, the advertiser uh, a couple of Sundays ago that did summarize 
uh, all the bills that passed, right. all the bills that are pending. And I encourage anybody to read that. Well, Dan, what were some of your disappointments? So where did the legislature let you down? Um, term limits, not so much. I proposed a term limit bill that was recommended by the commission 4-3. And there, even though there's a split of opinion, I thought it was necessary to restore public trust. I think the public really wants it and they want to vote on it. So I would like to see that move. Uh, access to public records was a disappointment. Um, right now, access to public records depends how much money you have. Uh, people with money can, can buy their way in. People without money cannot. So we recommended a bill uh, in 2022 that was passed and vetoed by the governor that reduced the cost to access public records, made electronic records free without cost, and if they were in the public interest, to make them free as well. Um, that passed the House, um, but his problems in the Senate is now his conference committee. Since it passed the year before, I was disappointed it didn't pass. Uh, some of the concerns some state agencies raised, we thought we addressed. Mm. Uh, uh, solicitation and acceptance of contributions during a session. Uh, we recommended last year uh, no uh, fundraisers during sessions. That passed. But what didn't pass was soliciting and accepting funds during session. That hasn't passed. I would hope that would pass. Uh, well, one of the problems with that bill now, last year the legislature expanded it to all elected officials not just legislators can't have fundraisers uh, during sessions or all elected officials can't solicit or accept funds during session. Our recommendation was just legislators and candidates for the legislature. Nice, simple bill. Uh, I think that should pass. Um, the um, um, contribution from people receiving public funds, whether commercial or non-commercial, that should pass. Um, campaign funds should be limited to campaigns. So there are some significant measures. Um, and I do think there's some interest in the legislature. I don't think we should um, we should throw our hands and give up because they didn't pass in the first session. You've been around, you know, quite often a bill will be introduced in one session, it may take one or more sessions to have it become law. Right. So, you know, disappointed, um, not every single proposal, as we recommended, didn't pass as is in the first session, but that's the legislative process. And you just keep working until you get the rest. And that's what I intend to do. Dan, you mentioned conference committees, and uh, that made me think about the fact that this year uh, there was a lot of concern about how the state budget was passed. One lawmaker even said that uh, things were added to the budget even after the conference com committee voted on it. Did the commission come up with recommendations on how to combat these sort of backroom deals? Well, we discussed the Sunshine Law, and that applies to the county councils and executive agencies. And one of the problems in applying it to the legislature, which would address the problem, is that the legislature meets in a short session, 60 days, with short deadlines. It just isn't practical. Even uh, Brian Black, who's probably the biggest advocate for transparency for the Civil Liberty Law Center, recognized. But as many principles as a sunshine law should be adopted. And the budget's probably the best example of, of a need for reform. That should never happen again. Um, you can extend a session. You can come up with your draft budget earlier, not wait to the last minute. People should not be voting on measures they haven't read. Um, things shouldn't be added to a measure. I don't even know if that's legal uh, after it's voted upon. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the budget this year is a sort of the poster child on not how to do things. And, and that shouldn't be repeated. I hear part of the problem was we lost Sylvia Luke, who's a master of the budget, and we got a new budget chair, not to blame him. Um, but it, it's not a matter of individuals, it's the process. Uh, we, in discussion, said that uh, the public should have access to these discussions on the budget, should be able to see what's being proposed and being discussed. And I do think the House should take that up in its rules. Dan, do you think it would help if members of the public were allowed to testify before conference committee? Um, I never against public input. That's always a good thing. 
Um, and to the degree that that can be accommodated, it should be, especially the way conference committees operated. Uh, if they significantly change a bill, public should be able to see that proposed amendment and respond. So I guess the short answer is yes. And the legislature should think of a way to accommodate that, either by uh, to put it all out there, to have a break, to have the the, the discussions uh, public. Um, we wanted uh, discussions public. In the Constitution, it talks about meetings of the legislature being public. So, um, you know, you don't have to adopt the Sunshine Law to just have your your committee hearings more transparent. Now, the conference committee, especially the budget conference committee, um, was the opposite of transparent. But I can tell you this much. I spent most of my time appearing before the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, and they were very transparent uh, what they recommended. They gave good reasons for if they were going to defer a bill. They said why. Um, and their decision making was reason and public. So I would like to see uh, more committees uh, follow the model of those two judiciary committees. Well, that sounds great. Well, Dan, you've provided such a, a great amount of insight. I appreciate it tremendously. We've got one minute left and I want to give it to you to tell us exactly what do we need to do to help bring down the rate of public corruption in Hawaii and to be the transparent government that we need to have. Well, I think there's some great organizations, the Ethics Commission, the Campaign Spending Commission, Common Cause, League of Women Voters, uh, to participate in, to follow. Um, Civil Beat has done, I think, a very good job in, in covering um, the legislative and government process and misdoings. But ultimately, I think, is to um, pay attention, uh, engage your legislator. Uh, see what your legislator is doing, because legislators respond to their constituents. And you look at the legislative election districts, you only have a couple of thousand votes here and there. A few hundred people in election district, um, you know, stand up. They can make a difference. They can get the attention, you know, of their their legislator. Um, I know everybody's busy. People have two jobs. You know, they have to take care of their kids. There's so much to do. But as much attention you can have on your legislative process, on your administrative agencies, on your government, what affects you, your city council, look how the public's responding to the pay raises at the city council. That's a great example of citizen action, and that may make a difference. Well, very good. Well, thank you for your call to civic engagement, and thank you for your work on building a more transparent government here in, here in Hawaii. Dan, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. My guest has been Dan Foley, former judge and still a very strong figure in helping Hawaii become what it needs to become. I'm your host, Kelee Akina. You're watching Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Until next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.